Welcome to the Select Board Board of Health meeting um, in the town of Deerfield on April 21st, 2021, uh, and it is remote. And Trevor, do you feel okay enough to read that all that? I feel okay, but I will. Um, <laughs> you make me uh, feel really guilty. <laughs> no, I don't mean to do that. Uh, meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20. Meetings typically broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television. Remote meeting connections are noted if you go to our town website, um, down on the bottom right at the calendar, you can see our upcoming meetings. You can click on this meeting or the finance or capital meeting. They're all meeting tonight. The same link is there. Uh, you can click on that link for this Zoom meeting, or if you're watching on FCAT, you want to call in and make a comment, you can dial 312-626-6799. Uh, you would type in the meeting ID of 911-604-1580, and uh, should you need a passcode, it's 570012. And welcome. Thank you, Trevor. Um, okay. I see that Dan's here. So Dan, hello. Thank you for coming. Hello, everybody. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Dan. Hi, Dan. Um, okay, Casey and Dan, do you want to um, talk about what we're going to do? You want to start, Dan, or do you want me to? <laughs> no, go ahead, Casey. Okay. So what we're trying, one of the reasons I asked everybody to, to chat is because we need to determine the um, time start time for town meeting and and start to go over some of these articles so mm -hmm. I fleshed out a very draft warrant and sent it out to Dan and Lisa and I had talked to Jennifer and Adam who really coordinated over at the school most of what happened over at the school last year and came back with a suggested start time of 9 a.m. And the reason I really want you guys and Dan to talk is because there's a lot on this warrant. And I really want, just for my own edification in terms of making adjustments in those warrant, in the warrant, I want Dan to really chime in so that we can facilitate um, going, doing town meeting as expeditiously as possible without interrupting the democratic process. Oh, uh, yeah, it is a pretty big warrant. So I started out with the, I'm thinking, hold on. I started out with the financial articles mm -hmm. and progressed in a similar manner, Dan, as we did it last year. I think I might've forgotten one, so I have to go back and look. Um, but it's something I think we could put into the, the first warrant article, which or the first or the second consent article. Uh, but basically what I tried to do is kind of use the format that we had before where we had the consent article that had elements that were relatively boilerplate and then break out to the individual articles like the annual budget, SCEMS, uh, budget, wastewater enterprise fund, that sort of thing. So I wanted, your, I wanted to take your temperature on that progression but also there was a couple, now that you should know, the warrant isn't closed. I'm gonna ask the board to close the warrant as of the fifth, because I think there's a couple of outliers. John Pachurik, the chief mentioned one to me that I have in a, a newer draft copy that I'll put out after we have this conversation. But I just wanted to see if that progression, it seemed to work last year. I just wanna make, make sure it works for you. Yeah, I mean, I think the consent articles are key, Casey. And I, you know, I, I, I'm going through the warrant. I don't see a whole lot more that we could probably tuck into a consent. Hopefully, things will move quickly. But I think a lot of things are going to require comment. So, um, the only one I was thinking about was the grant, um, the the authorization for signatures of grants. It occurred to me. I think it was five this morning while I was walking my dog <laughs> that I might have forgotten that. So that was that little element I thought if I if I've forgotten it I'll want to put that in but I wanted to ask about it because right you have acceptance of grants but you're talking signature of grants well I think acceptance really fits it but honestly at five in the morning I couldn't picture the warrant in my face yeah. so. <laughs> no, it's there yeah, I think you've got it under e and then okay. you'll notice Dan there's a lot of zoning articles 
And that was really, Lisa and I had a conversation on Monday about it. We had talked about it last week, but then we had a conversation on Monday and I, I just, I want everybody to know that there's five of them and at least two general bylaw changes. Well, um, because of the meeting is outside and you know, we don't really know what the weather's going to be, but assuming it's a nice day, it will get hot as time goes on. So um, I was going to have, we had, to when we had long warrants in the past, we've had informational nights or something that's really controversial that might take an awful lot of time on town yes. meeting. We tried to um, have discussion of it prior to. So my recommendation, as long as um, Dave and Trevor are fine with it, would be to have an informational night, maybe, you know, one of our off meetings, maybe the end of May, like the 26th or something like that. Or I don't want to get it too close to town meeting, but you don't want it too far away either. But mm -hmm. so we'll pick some kind of date. But um, I think it's really important that, you know, that some of this zoning gets discussed. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we may might be able to eliminate the discussion on town meeting floor or, you know, reduce the discussion on town meeting. And so that was one thing, Dan, that, that Carolyn and I had talked about last week. And we both think it's a good idea. It will help present the budget, but it could also, like she said, present background on the zoning articles. And it could certainly be televised in a similar manner as what we do now. So um, it could also- I have I just want to know, I haven't talked to the, I haven't talked to the planning board. I did. I um, haven't either. Anna Lee was aware of it because I had sent her um, an email, uh, but I hadn't, I mean, there was been no discussion from the planning board either. So I don't know if they would support the idea, but I, I, I can't imagine that they would, I mean, Denise is on right now, yeah. but. Carolyn, I'm, you know, I'm sure we can probably, we can discuss it Monday night at our meeting. I don't okay. think it's a problem. I think it's a great idea to do that. A lot well, of towns just, do a pre-town meeting. Yeah. Well, we we do one um, when we have you know pretty big issues, and so this this together this is a lot of information. So if people had the opportunity to have some explanation, I think it would help. So what do you think, Dan? Yeah, I think they're spectacular if they're done correctly. I mean, I, they really need to be informational and not uh, advocacy for one any, one side or the other. I really like that to happen uh, at the meeting. But uh, I think it's a good chance to, to flesh out some questions and for people to get information. And uh, you know, not everyone can attend them, but it, it does give some leeway at town meeting to say, listen, we had this opportunity to kind of ask real specific questions before we got here. We need to kind of move through things thoroughly, but, but uh, quickly. Okay, because I could see if FCAT could rerun it if they, you know, not only will it be up on the website, in this format, but we could see if FCAT could rerun it so people had a chance before town meeting to watch it again. That'd be great. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Let me write myself a note. And so one other thing I wanted to say, and I, Jennifer mentioned it to me as we were talking yesterday about time frames and setup, Dan, and I think it would be useful. I think she talked to Bob. Barb left before I could quick question her. I, I was talking to Dave was, as I was handing him his um, packet. But those voting cards, I think it'll be easier for people to see. We used them last year. You know, the, yeah. the, colored, the colored cards, yes or no. Yeah, I, I, uh, I wasn't a huge fan to start. And I actually, from my perspective, uh, it's it's a lot easier for me to count. I can tell you that. Okay. Uh, we just just have to have good control over the cards, and and Barb okay. does a great job of that. And <clears throat> so I don't know if everybody realizes, but they are doing the track right now over at Frontier. If they aren't done with it, or if they've got seed that they've had to put in for the grass part, we may be in. It's very likely we're going to be in a side field. So one of the things that I've asked Adam to work with Barbara and Jennifer on is to really make sure that we have good control over the entrance so that Barbara's uh, check-ins can be done effectively and so that we can make sure that the other elements that she has to pass out get handled um, efficiently for, for people. Okay. Yeah, that becomes more difficult over there, but it's really important that they filter through a right. singular space, obviously. Right. 
All right. Dan, did you have any other concerns or any thoughts on anything else? No, no, I just, it's the hardest part for me is to just really kind of, you know, keep things moving and, and allow everyone to speak. So it, it's just really helpful if the head table can kind of get their, their motion out and their comment and then just kind of let it flow naturally from the, the crowd. There's a lot of dialogue that goes back and forth that really, should, you know, it really should be directed back to the moderator and then off, off to you if necessary. So if we can all work together on that, I just think it's, we're just under tight time constraints here and we wanna get through this. So that's, that's always the hardest part for me personally. But. Okay. I think we're all appreciative of this. I just, I just don't want people sitting out in the hot sun. That's all. Rocky. You're I think muted. you're on mute, Rocky. Whoops. There we go. The, will you be, last year, they ran around with a microphone, okay, the portable microphones. Uh, do you find it easier doing it with that or having a, 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 like a singular uh, st microphone stand so people come up to it? Remember somebody had a question or something like that about whatever the article was. The uh, FGAP people were running all over the place, you know, with the microphones. Well, part of that was a public health reason because, you know, you don't want people moving around. Okay. But I think it's pretty clear that it's aerosols, everything is transmitted by aerosols. And when you're outside, the aerosols are pretty limited. So I don't know, Dan, it's really up to you. From a public health point of view, I don't think it's really impactful that much. Okay. I, I'm with you, Carolyn. It really was the public health issue. So I think it's more efficient to have people come up um, because you can queue them right up. It's easier for FCAD if they don't see what I'm pointing at. That's trying to figure out who's going to go next. And if there's just a line, it's pretty efficient. But yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's why. I'm okay, then what we'll do question. when we will set up uh, an alleyway in the middle, then maybe Casey, are you getting this? And then we'll um, X out. I don't, you know, tape is not going to stick to the grass. So we'll have to have some, Paint. you know, space because people's perception of space, you know, gets skewed. You can a use bit. a little line, a little yeah. line that they mark uh, ball fields. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Use that chalk stuff. I mean, yep. I think somebody ha must have some and we can just, you the know. The baseball team has it. Oh, yep. okay. Yep. Well, then we can just mark out like mark markings mm -hmm. where people appropriate space. Um, behind the microphone in case there's, you know, people line up. Sometimes there's only one or two speakers, but if like Dan is saying, if we have a line, then um, I think it'll be okay. We'll have to just make sure people are spread out enough so that when they walk by each other, whatever. I, I think with a lot, of the, a lot of these zoning articles, there's gonna be a lot of comment and at least they'll know it's coming. They can line up ahead of time and we use cones to space them out. But I think that is a better idea than having people run back and forth for sure. Okay. Yeah, we just, as long as people are not next to each other and have masks on, there really is not any public health issues. I'm more in favor of have splitting the uh, field into thirds, mm -hmm. have it uh, mimic more like the auditorium where you have two aisle ways, you have two microphones yeah. set up. Mm -hmm. Oh Dave, you know what? That's a really good idea. All right, Casey, did you take notes on that? I, yes. <laughs> I like that idea even better, Dave, because then you have less, less traffic. So Dan, with a with it, the field split in thirds. What we're going to have to do is figure out how to do that um, so that you can see. Mm -hmm. In other words, the dis the width distance. I'm just concerned about everybody being able to to get to those two mic stands where you can see them and you know they can see us really. Mostly you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe the mics can be on the sides and the return can be down the middle or something. We can we can figure that out. Yep. Okay. Anything else anybody bring up? It really went pretty smoothly, you know, the last two that we had. So um, there really wasn't a lot of improvement that we can think of. And so let me just let Dan know 
that there's a couple of things, like I said, there's a couple of outliers. So I have an age waiver for a police officer. Um, and I have to ask the board a couple questions about, there's a general bylaw change possibly for CIPC to change the 60 day limitation. It's something that Jeff's brought up at uh, several meetings. And I started to look into it last night. Um, so that may be, I've got a placeholder in a, in a newer version because you know people uh, come out of the woodwork every time I say, hey, we're about to close the warrant. So I just wanted you to know that I'm thinking there may be four additional articles, but what I would wanna do is strategize with your placement. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Dan, for coming. If there's no other comments. Thank you. Great to see everyone. All right. Thanks, Dan. Take care. All right. Um, Candace, can you send a text or something to Kansas and see if maybe she can come as earlier? Um, so then we'll move on to um, select board announcements. Why Casey's seeing if Candace might able to become. I, I, one of the announcements I have is May 9th is a plant sale on the lawn of the South County Senior Center for the Frontier uh, baseball team. And I think potentially there's a um, Tilton Library tag sale May 22nd for um, the benefit of the Tilton Library. Yeah. Trevor or Dave, do you have any announcements? Um, just, you know what? what we'll probably talk a little later, but the sewer, you know, is moving forward. We're waiting for, um, you know, I think the plans, the contract was sent out uh, from uh, Prickett's office to us, to Casey and uh, to Waterline for them to review and sign. And then we'll get that out to, um, to Lisa for her review. Um, but we'll get moving on that. You know, we, they're anxious to get in the ground as early as they can, you know, and take advantage of the spring and summer. So, um, and then we, we are still working on putting together the, you know, we have an emergency repair pipe work up in Old Deerfield. Uh, so we're working with the nonprofits on, on some aspect of that. And then also on, um, you know, all the rest that needs to get done. And we, we do have some, some pipe work to do in, in, um, South Deerfield Center. We have pipe work to do all over, but just I'm talking like the emergency stuff that ready to collapse that we really need to roll into a, a funding source and uh, get get moving on some aspects of, of that. We're, we're trying to get another help from USDA on a separate loan and a separate project for, for that pipe work. So I'll, I'll bring more information when we have it, but we're working hard on trying to get that laid out um, before we have a catastrophe on our hands. So other than that, I don't have anything else. Okay. Um, I would like to uh, offer condolences to a passing of a former town employee, uh, oh. Luke Gorey, uh, at the age oh. of 36, just passed away. Oh, sorry to oh. hear that. I didn't even know. Thank you. And, uh, you know, he had worked for the town for a number of years uh, until his health issues uh, prohibited it. And, well done. It's well, thank you, Dave. Age. He yeah, was also a volunteer easy. firefighter. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, on a personal note, um, it was always nice to have the Gory twins around, Blake and Luke. Yeah. Because they took off all the heat off the previous twins that raised Helen Town, <laughs> David and Dana. <laughs> so when they came along, they, people forgot about us two. <laughs> so well, I'm sorry for the loss. Yeah. I did not know know him, but um, I have seen people mention yeah. how what a kind heart he had, and, and everybody yeah. seemed to love him a lot. So I'm yeah. sorry for his passing. Yeah. So. But, uh, Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Um, yeah. Board of Health comments. Um, I um, had some initial conversations with uh, Barbara Hancock, and um, you know our numbers are pretty stable that it's residual virus is circulating. There's no question. Um, but we're thinking that maybe after, um, you know, town elections and town, you know, meeting has gone through and she's filed the paperwork, we're, we'll open for 
try to open for limited hours at some point. And the appointments would be down in the middle of the town hall, you know, where we have our select board meetings normally, you know, and try to keep them like 10 minutes, you know, as short as possible. We still just cannot be open where people just wander around and visit offices and stuff. Cause we just, the, the number one, problem is we just don't have a lot of capacity in our departments mm -hmm. so if someone's out sick stuff doesn't get done and even though we have vaccine people are vaccinating or starting to get vaccinated it's just um you know you can still get sick you can and, and everybody works in such confined spaces they've been very good and we you know we need we need to get the paperwork done and we need to file all our reports and you know just we have to be careful. So, you know, we'll, we'll work on it. Um, one of the issues I think of not having the town hall open is, um, you know, we don't have nurse, nurse visiting, but truthfully, Lisa's not been available anyway, because she's in charge of vaccine management for the whole county and she's tied up. So, um, Waitley is putting, um, you know, has put out a public health um, grant um, that they'll hear about in the next week or two. So maybe we could borrow some hours from um, Waitley's uh, public health nurse if they get expanded hours to come over and, you know, work with our seniors once we get the tent up, you know, so that we can still have some nurse hours. Um, but we just haven't had any public health nurse hours, you know, right along since the pandemic. So because uh, Lisa was tied up with contact tracing until we got a couple extra people at the FERCOG to do that. And then she's been doing vaccine management. So I know seniors are very concerned about not having their, you know, senior hours every week, but truthfully, she's not available anyway. So we'll try to come up with some alternative. Um, all right, next item on the, oh, is there anything else that anyone wanted to say? Okay. Next item on the agenda is the poll workers. Um, have you had a chance to look at that, Trevor and Dave? I have. Okay. I have. Yep. I'm good. All right. I'll take so, a motion. Uh, the only thing I have on that is so. It's, it's um, sorry, but on Bardis, her name's spelt wrong. But other than that. Oh, Cheryl Bardis's name is yeah, spelled wrong. Sherry Bardis. Oh, Sherry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, All right. But, Casey, can we still vote this with the correction? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, what you do is you'll vote it with the, you'll, in the motion, correct the spelling or address the fact that it needs to be corrected. And then Barb can correct it and y'all can sign it. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion. I'll make that motion to accept the uh, list of uh, poll workers submitted by uh, Barbara Hancock. Trevor, you're going to second it? No, I'll second that motion and thank everybody for serving. Really appreciate it. We couldn't run our elections without all these people stepping up to help. So thank you very much. Um, okay. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Dave Hi, Trevor. Hi, Trevor McDaniel. Hi, Dave Wolfram. Okay. Thank you. And um, Casey, can you just make sure that um, Barbara knows that to look into Sher uh, Sherry's Barch's name? Yes. Okay. Um, and I just want to say the elections will probably be the same setup that we've had for the September and November elections. People come through the front door, um, all the doors will be open, and then they'll come through the front door and then out by the assessor's office. So mm -hmm. it will, you know, be ver very, from a public health point of view, very low risk. All right, next, next item on the agenda is request for comments on the zoning um, amendments bylaw. Uh, do you want to take them one at a time, um, both, or do you want to just mention well, stuff? My, uh, I guess my main comments I have are on the site plan, um, site plan review. I just wanted to go over that a little bit. I read it in detail and just, and maybe some of this, uh, a lot of this is probably my ignorance and I'm not a land use uh, person. So I, I just, um, 
a couple of the things in section 444, I'll just go down my list here. Section 445, 444 is priest and middle meetings. I thought that in the um, public hearing, we talked about the priest and middle meeting would be uh, strongly encouraged or recommended, but um, the, the paperwork I have here, and I don't know if I have the most current, but it says shall meet with a uh, planning board. So it says prior to filling an application for site plan review, all applicants for site plan review shall meet with planning board building commissioner to discuss. And, and I think we talked about, go ahead, Casey, you can hand up there. Lisa had a comment that, about that as well, um, yeah. Lisa Mead. Yeah. So I think you may see that addressed. Okay, the, uh, yeah. And I think, I think what I was just going to say to everybody is I we have you posted to attend the hearing okay the hearings for these so um, I just want to remind people that you're posted to attend both okay. planning board for these two hearings and then zoning board for treehouse okay so I, I think it is important that we um, go over these just so that we have comments I yeah. mean the planning board knows what the select board comments are yep so okay. that was that was one that you know we think should be strongly recommended i guess uh, encouraged because i think it's a great idea but i don't think it should be shall so um next is six four four six on public hearings i was um wondering that uh, parties parties in interest seems like it's been a kind of a a little bit of a mission creep um because I, I i'm not sure i think you the requirements for a public hearing are all the abutters need to be notified but now we, we are adding, I think, parties in interest, which is kind of a, a more of a broad net. And I'm just, I'm trying to figure out who, who really determines that. I know it's in the, um, it's in the definitions, but um, it just makes it difficult for the people trying to make these things. If, you know, if it's in law and they are a butter, they get notified, but now we're adding another category of people of persons of interest. And I just, I'm concerned about that. So maybe it's not a big deal. I just wanted to mention it. So um, before we move on, Trevor, did Lisa have any comments on that, Casey? On that I don't remember about the parties and interest. I do remember that she wanted the pre-submittal meetings to be with staff um, mm -hmm. because I think there's a preclusion. You can't have a pre-submittal meeting with the planning board itself. I was thinking while well, while you were talking, Trevor, I think yep. because you have to have an application on the table in order to meet with the planning board. So I think what she wanted to see was staff meeting, pre staff pre submittal meetings. Mm -hmm. And then the planning board meets with the applicant once the applicant submitted. But yeah. parties and interest, I'll have to check my. I can't well, my remember. worry would be as how enforceable it is and what the interpretation is because. Right. Um, I mean, going back to the solar one that we haven't reviewed yet, you know, I was concerned about the shadows being in there and it, and it got removed, but yeah. you know, how do you, re how do you enforce it or how does that translate to us as a town? And so exactly. again, I would, this would be the thing that I would be concerned about, not that we have any problem with it. It's just, how does that be, how is that interpreted and how is that enforced? And I'm, 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 I'm worried about that being too nebulous it's not it's not well, defined right, right. as okay. an abutter you're defined because you own property next to the item and if, and you, and if item. you're not notified it's clear you're not notified mm -hmm. but if you if you are interest i mean how how we how do we know parties of interest or if you feel like you're interest but you're excluded now you're challenging that I, that right. just seems kind of gray area so that's all that was my concern so yeah. but, um and then uh, let's see. Under I'm sorry, this is this is a th this is a major change. Just to it's very it. much so. This site plan review change is it, it's twice the or more than twice what it was before. So I think people really should read it and pay attention to it. It's an immense amount of work for people when you're putting an addition on. I mean, I understand when you're putting a factory and you have a lot of stuff, but there, there's an immense amount of work for people here and requirements now. So this is still under section five, five, uh, excuse me, five, four, four, six under public, or excuse me, five, four, five, oh, plan specifications. Um, under F, um, 
section five, an interior traffic and pedestrian circulation plan is designed. So you have to also tell people how they're going to tell the planning board how the people are going to walk in the building, which I'm just wondering if that's a bit of an overreach too. I mean, I understand with certain things you want traffic flow, but um, I, that just seems excessive, but that was just a question. Um, and then the next item, uh, uh, H is plan should include a tree inventory and landscaping plan that identifies significant groups of trees or individual specimen trees, including specimen size, health, prepared by an arborist, landscape architect, ecolog um, ecologist, or qualified professional. The plan shall identify existing tree six inch uh, caliper or uh, larger at breast height, 4.5 feet above ground and existing tree shrub masses, proposed planting, landscaping, screening. It goes on to subsections of this, but this, it feels like it's normal if uh, you're putting an addition on, you've got three or four trees on the property, but if you're putting in uh, a new building on attractive land with 5,000 trees on it or a thousand trees on it, uh, that just seems excessive for them to do. I mean, I understand if you had maybe a radius around the building, but to uh, catalog all the trees on a 15 acre piece of property just also seems excessive and amount, a lot of money uh, to do. You're hiring a, 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 you know, an arborist to, to make sure every tree is cataloged at, at a certain size or bigger. Um, I don't, it just seems broad as well, but I understand the, the intent uh, that we want to keep our trees and minimize. I mean, a lot of this green, um, you know, the green bylaw uh, work is, is to, you know, make sure that we can keep within our, um, keep the character, the natural character of the property. But I, I'm just wondering if that is a bit more than people are capable of on a, on a really large project. Um, how about, or, or just a project with a massive amount of trees. How about how about we um, uh, our comment to the select I mean to the planning board then would be to um, within a hundred feet of the building. Uh, yeah, it seems right. like somewhere around that shape. Uh, you know, I I understand. Or, or the building, the building footprint, or the you know the mm -hmm. pervious surfaces. You know, like if you're in, like a parking lot, maybe I don't know. There, there's a lot to do with trees, you know, um, drip edge of the tree. And so if you have a 10, a 10 inch diameter tree, you're going out 20 feet circle around that tree that you can't disturb. And I get, so part of my worry is that we're going to require all this stuff with the trees. The guys are just going to bulldoze it down. If they have to, you know, they're like, well, why bother? If I take the tree out, then I don't have to worry about all this stuff. I just, I know that there's some fine balance there reading further into it that you're really incentivizing keeping a natural landscape and all. I just don't want it so onerous on, on the builders or the developers that they just end up clear cutting because it's easier to do that than to catalog. So if it is a little more defined around the project and we can keep more of a natural flow around everything and keep as many trees as possible, I was just worried it was gonna be too much and they were just going to end up cutting stuff down. So um, uh, let's see. Um, I think that's all I have there. I have quite a few notes, so just bear with me a sec. Like I said, it's a huge bylaw. Um, and it's just like the uh, maximum extent. I can I can get these to Casey too, so I don't want to take up the whole meeting. But um, there's another whole section on tree preservation, um, and it had to do with uh, preservation of open space and trees on the site. Um, uh, so I was wondering what the evaluation criteria is of of that. Um, again, I can write these out and get them to Casey. Okay. Um, I don't know for my time. This is this could come from 60 inches. Okay, so that. Um, uh, the, the, uh, another section was section D of this is no. under preservation 5492. 
section D, was any trees identified for preservation above that are removed or lost during construction shall be replaced. Replacement trees shall be native species. And, and I get all of that too, and they kind of nail down what size tree, if it's 19 inch diameter, you replace it with something four inches. Um, but what I was wondering is if, if there isn't room for this on a specific site, would they, um, would they allow a lot like um, the, ever source or something, if they're doing something one area, they can plant a tree somewhere else. Um, and I wondered if you could offsite the tree planting, if you were taking out several trees, but there was really no place to feasibly to put a tree that made sense on the property, could you place it on the town tree belt or some other area that was, you know, on the Franklin Land Trust or something like that. So it wasn't, you know, just having to put a tree there that really didn't fit. Actually, that's a good idea. I like that idea. Make sure that gets into the notes. Um, the the last, uh, I think, well, not the last, uh, 5493 orientation of buildings for solar Middle access. Um, this the birds. A, a section one, building orientation. I think takes John, a, just excuse me, Trevor. I think John Pareski doesn't realize that he's not muted. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I muted him. Okay, okay, thanks. So, John, you're going to yell. Uh, or, orientation of buildings for solar access. So it was it was kind of requiring that the building be sited a specific way uh, on the property, and I just wondered if it didn't match the needs of the site. I mean, we always want to try and plan for, you know, encourage that, but I I wondered if it didn't if it just didn't fit with the design or the process of the building or say manufacturing process in the building or something, the way the machines lay out, if it didn't, you know, it was like the long axis of the building should face within 10 degrees of due south, if not possible. And, and so we were planning for, I think the idea is, I understand the idea of it, but I don't know if it, if all of these things can be waived by the planning board or if they must fit into those needs because sometimes well, the building it, orientation uh, may not for work. Her, if you if you look at the what it says is to the extent feasibly based okay good and yep. i mean that's what that's what's always critical when yes. the, is if it's feasible right you know, i mean as much as possible what you're trying to do is lay out yeah the and encourage desirable, the most yep. desirable thing that we want yeah but you if know, it doesn't fit their it, needs right, right. That was that was a bit of my concern. So as long as that's there, I'm good with that. Um, uh, parking, and I assume that there. This is a uh, five four nine six under parking and trip reduction. Uh, parking A one. Um, it was reserving parking spaces for electric vehicles, compact car, low emission vehicles, or carpools and van pools. Uh, again, to the extent feasible which is fine then. I guess it's set aside at 10%. And I wondered if those things could be combined, you know, if it wasn't a real large parking lot and you could combine the electric compact, you know, those kind of things into two spaces or something like that, where it didn't have to be one for each one of those. Um, I, again, I think it's, uh, I'm not trying. Fine. No, nope, that's but fine. The thought, the thought process is that you want to try to make sure that there is accommodations made. Yes. But on the other hand, paving over additional surfaces and having more um, impervious surface to accommodate that is not uh, desirable. So, uh, you know, when the person comes or the applicant mm -hmm. comes, you know, if, if it's like a Walmart thing, there's plenty of space in the right. parking lot because you'll have to have X number of parking spaces to do that. But yeah. if it's just, you know, a small retail establishment and they have eight spaces, then, you know, you're, you will, would have um, overlap because yeah. you wouldn't want this giant parking lot for like a requirement of eight spaces or something. So I, I think I think what it is is to add discretion. I don't know. Um, yeah, and I think they other... have it there. It seems like it was to the extent feasible, and that's fine. As long as they can okay. stack them up, you know, and um, the, the last, I think the last item I had was, um, was about the, 
the bicycle access and all, which I think is great, but they were also requiring if you were bigger than 50,000 square foot, you had to provide showers and changing rooms. Um, and I don't know, again, if that's to the extent feasible, that's fine too. Yeah. I think it's a, a great idea. Does, I just wondered it does, about. It does say that, Trevor. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So I'm good. That was it. That's all I got. Um, I think maybe, uh, I guess my comment would be then to just, we need to highlight the, the fact that this is not mandatory. This is, you're, you're laying out highly desirable things. And if the applicant can make it possible to have the high, highly desirable things, then you can have, so in the comments, Casey, I would put in we need to emphasize that it is to the extent feasible or high, highly desirable. I don't know, we can talk to the planning board on how they wanna emphasize that it's, it's the ideal and the ideal is to get the per applicant as close to the ideal as possible. In the in, they have incentivized the green performance standards uh, which are, you know, like green roofs, blue roofs, that kind of thing. And then, you know, so it allows them like more parking spaces if they do a, a sod roof or something like that. So those are good, you know, ideas or 2000 square foot of rooftop solar panels, you could get a 10, 10, 10 percent reduction in the frontage or some other incentive you could pick, you know, building height, different things like that. So, um, so, so some of them, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, we're, we just, as we did this green incentive stuff as a select board and approved it, it was like, like as just as you said, if feasibly accept, you know, applicable. You didn't right. want to make it so onerous that nobody comes to build here. Um, right. That's I, I, I mean, I, I'm a hundred percent for our green infrastructure, mm -hmm. but we are probably not going to have composting toilets at the park. Right. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And the reason why is because we don't have the kind of situation that is is really accommodating for that. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, that's just my personal opinion right now, but mm -hmm. in the design phase, we'll be talking about that kind of stuff. So you need to be able to say, we would love to be a hundred percent, everything green, cutting yeah. edge, all that kind of stuff. but you have to be practical and 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 then there's also the trade-off what what are you if if you do this what what reduction can i get somewhere else so yeah you know is a reduction what? parking place is going to mean that you're going to have you know pervious surfaces maybe mm -hmm. maybe that's the way we do it i don't know yeah. i mean it's up to the planning board yeah but, um i think maybe then so our my comment would be you know, we want this to be highly encouraged, but not to scare to off, scare off people, which I think is in line with what you're trying to do. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I, I I like all the ideas. I love the incentives and that kind of thing. And and some of it, obviously, there's there shall work in there in your site plan review. There's a lot that needs to be, you know, enforced and done. Um, but then you know, somewhere we can have leeway makes sense as well. Um, Dave, is that good for you too? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, as long as a lot of this is uh, suggested um, guidelines and not a mandated guideline, uh, because if it was a mandated, you basically have done away with any growth within the town of Deerfield. So, by the way, a lot of this is written. And, you know, here again, I've got to go over it a couple more times because, you know, it's like the the last bylaw that we passed, I was looking at some of the wrong information when it was passed and mm -hmm. that wasn't good. So, uh, because the floodplain that I was looking at was not the one that was actually being used. And so basically, you know, all Melnick's property and everything can't be built now because it's in the floodplain. So. Um, well, we're using the existing floodplain, right? We haven't changed the floodplain yet. Well, but the one that's pub there's a couple of them that are published and they're not the same zones. So the one I was looking at was a different zone than the one that the building commissioner is actually using. Okay. So, um, 
the only other thing I have is in here again, maybe I'm misreading it, is in the uh, special permit on, on the solar, but um, they struck out special permit granting authority. And I'm interpreting that is that they're taking the authority of the ZBA away. And that's on section 3852. Um, it's to me, it's kind of a, a backdoor way of doing away with the CBA, and I'm not happy with that. Um, we should probably get clarification on that because I, yeah. I actually didn't interpret. Probably uh, ask Lisa about that. Yeah. But um, and here again, maybe I'm just mis misreading it, but you know. I I don't know. I did not read it that way, but. Yeah. It is an interpretation. So Casey, yeah. can you get check with Lisa on that? Because if Dave is correct, I, I I believe that we're probably would have a comment on that. Yeah. Um but I agree with a lot of the comments that Trevor and you have made, and it's uh okay. Uh, was there anything in particular about the solar? I mean, my only worry was the shadowing because I didn't figure, feel that we could be able to um, enforce that, but that's been removed from what I understand. So from my copy. Yeah, I had a concern with it because I've got solar panels on my barn and back and it shadows the property next door. So <laughs> and I well, wouldn't have been able to put them on. It's now existing non-conforming. Originally. <laughs> um, Okay, and then uh, the other one was Treehouse Brewing. I guess I just want to make sure that it's clear this, the select board is in favor of this, mm -hmm. um, especially the phased in process that they're doing. So um, we're not overwhelmed with all the, their ideas at once. Um, certainly, I, we can verify as a select board, all three of us have been at the clinics at Treehouse and mm -hmm. um, they've you know, had up to 750 car, car trips during a, you know, a six hour period with no issues with traffic. So I, I want to capture that detail. Um, I, I know they did traffic engineering for the planning board, but um, this is practical. Uh, and I, I think Dave, you said at one time Channing Beat had 300 active employees. Yes plus regular business. So there was truck deliveries plus 300 car, cars a day. So yeah, um, yeah it was very active. Yeah. I felt, you know, especially for phase one for Treehouse, um, I was very pleased that they're utilizing the app. Um, so it really controls who comes in and when they come in. Um, because, I, you know, I know that traffic has been an issue down in uh, Charlton, but then now they paid a lot of money. I talked to one of the owners and they had uh, spent a lot to develop this app so it could really limit, you know, a lot of advertisers would come and say, we need to advertise here and get more people. And and they're like, no, we need to kind of, you have, a, you have a way to limit people. And they really, they came up with a way to limit the amount of people that come in and when they come in. So they can do an orderly pickup. Um, and then as we get to phase two and they open the beer garden, you know, I'm sure that they you'll make an appointment as we were still in COVID here, or um, we'll just see how, how that goes. And they, they can work with DOT on, you know, improvements of five and 10 as they start moving up through in the, in the coming years after they, you know, develop five and 10 up to the fire station. Um, I think the next phase is further on. And I think they'll work with DOT to incorporate as they did down in Charlton to, um, you know, to make sure it's safe. They have other places on the property to bring in, you know, other access and stuff. So um, I feel like they have the funds and the foresight and the thought and experience to make sure the traffic is, you know, yeah. is uh, adhered to and people are safe. Um, that's really important. I, I just know with the work that's going on now, there will be no change to the footprint. So um, I don't have any concern about, you know, water or runoff or anything like that. They're putting a small portico on the end, on the northern end of the building, you know, just so that people can come and pick up and, and be shaded either from rain or sun or whatever in the meantime. Um, so that's already, that, that's already pervious surface. Yeah, so it's exactly. Pavement, pavement there so yeah. no, it seems, it seems like they're thinking things through and I know that I appreciate them uh, putting a lot of thought into the process and coming before our board and then bringing it on to the select board and the, I mean, the uh, CBA and and uh, planning boards. 
to. I wonder why is it colored in that pattern? And uh, Julie, can you mute your phone? Okay. I don't know how I'm trying to. Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, Treehouse hasn't actually applied for a liquor license from the town yet, right? No. No. Do you know what type of liquor license they're going to apply for? I thought it was uh, like a a lot. I, I thought it was similar to BBC's where it was a poor license. I think it's uh, a 19C. Yeah. I think, but they yeah. haven't confirmed that. Okay. The only a 19C is like a brewery state. pouring license. The only downside to that is, and we'll have to have Lisa check into it, is I think for that type of pouring license, they actually have to produce the, uh, the beer at the site. They, yeah, they are putting in a small brewery there. So they it won't are, be, yeah. they won't be brewing all of it, but yes, for that license, they do all have they need to. Is a small amount. Yes, they're going to do several barrels or something like that. Okay. Yeah. I just, uh, I, I hadn't it, heard that part yet. So, yes. I, I yeah. knew they were talking about distillery for yep. uh, spirit. Yeah. But I, I, I think that's going to be the distillery is the one that they're going to um, be pursuing the most. Yeah, yeah, and they so, will be doing um a, like a barrel or something because they yeah. have to do it for they that. They have license. to do that to get a pouring license. Yep, exactly. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we're yeah don't run into an obstacle. Sure. That we don't need or they don't. Okay. Need. Right. Um. So Casey, you're all set with the comments and stuff in general. You're muted, Casey. Casey, you're muted. I don't know if that was on purpose. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't mumbling this. to myself. No, I did the best I could to capture them. I may have to go back yeah. and reread. It doesn't matter them. because you know what? You it won't come to the hearings anyways. For, we'll come to the hearing um, because it's, you know, uh, again, this is more for public, um, you know, to make sure we have input and, and um, public discussion. So it's less stress on the town meeting floor. So, um, so don't worry about it as long as I, I, I Denise is, I got the, yeah. Denise is here. So she has heard firsthand, you know, basically. And she's taking notes. <laughs> I, I did that. take some notes. Uh, we, right. can, we can discuss this further Monday night, but you made yeah. a lot of yeah. good points, Trevor. I'll go through okay. everything again. So we're. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm seeing that Candace is here and I, and I think that Nancy is Nancy. From the library too, Nancy Maynard. But anyway, um, welcome, Candace. So um, we're ready for your update. We haven't seen you for a few months. Oh, hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. All right, let me just share my screen. Good job already. <laughs> yes. All right, and I'm gonna move a little thing around so I can just see better. Where can I put that? Okay. All right. So um, first, I want to say thank you um, to the select board, the finance committee, the capital improvements projects committee, and the town administrator, uh, and the general public for letting uh, the Tilton Library present an update of our building project tonight. So in order to demonstrate why uh, we think this project is so important, I first want to talk about the value of the library. So let's start with uh, what, why, how, and who. And uh, I don't know if you can tell what this is, but it's the stairwell going from the first to the second floor. And it's post-it notes from our patrons, uh, ans answers to a question of why they value and what they use, how they use our library. So pretty good response. All right, so we'll start with what? What is a library? A library is an essential resource. And it's really important for people to know that libraries are essential. They're not optional or extra, they're essential. And what we provide is literacy, information, connection, learning, sharing, and fun. <clears throat> Why is the town's library of value? because it provides a thriving, connected community. 
a library is an essential part of what we call a town civic infrastructure. How do we do this? Through materials like books, DVDs, CDs, e-books, e-audio books, newspapers, magazines, and such, technology, uh, instruction, discussion, workshops, and events. How indeed. So this is just a, um, a small list, but it's still a lot of all the things a library can provide and the Tilton does pr provide. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it here for five seconds for people to scan over. Um, I tried to make the list, uh, break it up a little bit visually so it would be easier to read. So, um, but um, this, is, this is what we do. And some of these things, I bet some people don't know that we do. Uh, for instance, did you know that you can borrow for free a musical instrument like a ukulele or a mandolin or a sewing machine? So how is it now? A library in the age of COVID, how did the, how does the library been faring in COVID? Um, you know, obviously this has affected every one of us, but you know, specifically, how did the library do? Well, well we stepped up and we made sure we kept the library running to some degree. Um, <clears throat> Ever since the, the shutdown, uh, you know, we started first with being available through email and really boosting um, information and resources on our website and purchasing a lot of extra ebooks. Um, we then moved to uh, cur limited curbside pickup, then more curbside pickup so people could have contact free pickup of their material outside of our building uh, by appointment also offered uh, are offering uh, curbside printing, copying and faxing services, also contact free. Um, we've had outdoor participatory activities like a story walk and um, some engaging uh, public art projects. We did the summer reading program entirely through the mail through a, an adult and teen literary journal and a kids interactive journal. Um, we are, have an ongoing archive of Deerfield people's COVID stories. We, um, in the good weather on Saturdays, we've offered an outdoor browsing event of um, select materials from our collection. We have also offered indoor browsing by appointment and computer use by appointment. We offered uh, virtual workshops, virtual events and virtual discussions. And like I said before, we've really uh, boosted our ebook collection. So the library is still in use and it's still essential. All right, so who does the library serve? In a word, everyone. Um, no matter your background, your stage of life, your income level, your race, ethnicity, um, everyone's welcome, a library doesn't discriminate. So um, each, each person or each group has a unique relationship with the library. And so I, I wanted to create this really full screen of pictures of users of the library. And so who, who are we doing this for? Who do we serve? Who are we aiming to serve better? And that's the users, the people in this town, um, young children. And as you can see, if you follow across from each um, age group, um, you know, they come in the mornings for story time after school, which is, you know, right next door or, you know, in the backyard, practically um, in the weekends. They, they do, you know, they have uh, learning time, sharing time, building time and uh, relaxing time. Tweens and teens, um, they come, you know, usually after school on the weekends, their school, as you know, right down the road, both middle and high school, right down the road. Uh, they come for quiet study, for collaborating on projects, for creating and for socializing. Um, adults and seniors, they come at all times, um, you know, morning, afternoon, after work, weekends, and they can participate in reading, meeting, planning, and connecting. And what I didn't show here is that the, le the connection between all the activities that all the age groups do, they're all, um, they can be done by any age group. Um, so basically, there's a lot of learning, sharing, building, relaxing, studying, collaborating, creating, socializing, reading, meeting, planning, and connecting for all ages. 
So yeah, wow, the Tilton can provide all of this? Yeah, we sure can, uh, but not without many obstacles, which is why we're here. So the obstacles with the current building um, are accessibility or lack of accessibility, lack of space, an old HVAC system, um, not energy efficient and not uh, enough computers. If you look at this photo, uh, there was a popular team program a couple summers ago and it was wonderful that it was so popular and the, the teens that came were so excited. But as you can see, you know, it, it's not a proper space to hold a program and it was blocking the entry to some of our um, you know, areas where our books are. Accessibility is not only important, but it's required. And as we move forward with, with an old building, it gets more and more challenging to be accessible. Uh, we have one bathroom on one floor, uh, no bathroom upstairs, very narrow spaces between the shelves and the necessary furniture. And we do have a lift that was added, oh, sometime in the 90s. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's, you know, it does the trick, but it's, it's far from ideal. It's a slow, clunky lift. It's not a proper elevator. So the space. Um, so the town, as you, I'm sure you know, has grown quite a bit in a um, hundred or so years, which is the age of the library, but the library has not. Um, there's not enough space for the number of items that we need, books, DVDs, um, you know, physical items um, that are required for us to have by the state. And it really is true that with every new book we get, one needs to be removed. And that just is, that's, that makes us sad. Um, the teen room is a narrow former closet. And as you can see here, only one person can go in at a time. So often uh, it's, not a, it's not a very welcoming space for teens. And as we showed before, teens do like to use the space for um, you know, after school on the weekends and for uh, whatever programs we have for them. Um, and speaking of programs, we have no separate room for um, meetings, workshops, and discussions which um, is something we do all the time and something all libraries do. It's a part of what libraries offer is, you know, meeting, meetings, uh, workshops on a number of topics and discussions, whether it's book discussions or discussions on current events or what have you. But it's, it's, a, it's a huge part of what we do and we're not able to, to do that uh, properly. So like I said before, HVAC, uh, the air we breathe. Um, definitely COVID has drawn attention um, to the fact that the library doesn't have a proper ventilation system for a healthy air in a busy public space. So that's something that would be a major, um, a major goal of ours for this new building is having a state-of-the-art HVA system. Energy efficiency. Um, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. An old building just doesn't have, especially an old brick building with old windows, just doesn't have the energy efficiency, um, which you know, a new build, a new building, especially a LEED certified building, which is what what our goal is for the new building is to, to be LEED certified, um, would save a lot of money for um, heating and cooling bills. <clears throat> Computer shortage. Um, even in this technological age, there is quite a few people in our community who do not have access to the internet or a computer or a printer. And um, the amount that we have at the library is, does not meet the town's needs. And that's been really obvious to us during COVID, but it was obvious to us before that as well. So um, we sought help. We decided to um, you know, apply for a grant and that was started by um, Sarah Woodbury, my predecessor in 2014. And then a building committee that identified the needs of the building were, uh, was done in 2015, our project manager and an architect were hired to do um, a first draft of a um, schematic design. Uh, a few community meetings were held for feedback on the design. Uh, a decision was made to renovate the existing historic building and expand it to the back. Uh, we did get a grant uh, and the grant for, from the uh, Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners is for 50% of the um, estimated project costs. So whatever the, the project was estimated at costing in 2017, which is um, about $8 million, then the, the, the fixed 50% of that, about $4 million is what we'll get. 
um, a Chilton Capital Campaign Committee started raising funds from private donors and businesses in 2017. And we've got quite a few pledges. Um, it's, it's our goal to raise $2 million to help the town, um, to, to, to help the ease the town's um, financial um, goal for this project. And we moved up the list from 15, which is where we started in 2017 to number five. And now we're gonna to move to the proposed library renovation. And you can see here a drawing of what it could look like. Uh, we believe it would address the obstacles and that we have uh, I've talked about tonight and meet Deerfield's growing needs. Um, and one thing to know is that this is an initial design. So even though we have to stay within the square footage, the footprint of the design, that um, you know, we're beholden to that. The design, as far as material selection and um, interior design, um, where things are placed, that could definitely will, ch will change. So if you look at the first floor, floor plan here, um, I'm just pointing out some of the things that you can see that we be an improvement from the obstacles I had talked about earlier. So if you, A is a program room where we would have meetings and uh, workshops and discussions and events. Uh, B is adding restrooms to the second floor, two restrooms. C is a, a new elevator, a proper elevator. D, um, the mechanical room, just, just kind of note, noting that that's you know, where we would have the, uh, the new HVIC program. And then E is um, the children's room and there'd be more space for, for kids. And overall, whole building throughout um, energy efficiency. So moving to the second floor, um, we have more space for books. B shows more computers. It would double the amount of computers that we have and, com and space for computers. Uh, C, a teen room, which would be um, one of the bigger other, you know, big goals for our new building is, um, is having a proper room for teens for them to have their own space, um, have, you know, attend their own programs, um, have their own meetings, and probably will draw more teens um, than we have. Uh, D just shows the elevator again. E is areas of quiet study. Uh, F is a new restroom, uh, two new restrooms. Actually, I didn't note that there were two. So there, there'll be four restrooms altogether as opposed to the one that we have now. And um, G just shows uh, like a smaller meeting room. And again, energy efficiency will be a big overall uh, theme. So, you know, after all this planning, as you know, then came COVID. So we were set to possibly get our grant. Uh, we were told about a year ago that we were set to possibly get offered our grant from the MBLC in July of 2020. Um, the program was put on pause because they were sensitive to the fact that most municipalities would not be able to even consider, um, you know, paying for a project like this because we didn't know what was you know what was coming um, and during this last year we the staff and I have noticed new obstacles in our current current building that weren't um, we, we hadn't noticed before because of COVID and the MBLC grant program is back on and it is possible we're number five like I said it's possible we might get offered the grant so we we need to be prepared um, if we will if we do get offered and we won't know until um, until then so um, the building needs, the additional building needs with a public health crisis. And I think uh, many of us are facing the fact that this will probably not be our last big public health crisis, um, but we sure wanna be prepared for them. And so things that stuck out for us um, as a library was um, making sure we designed for flexibility, indoor flexibility of space for, to allow social distance for staff and for patrons. Um, to have permanent outdoor structures for a curbside pickup, to have um, an area for outdoor computer usage, so outlets and um, maybe a, a pavilion type structure that would have protection from the elements, but it would still be, um, have more ventilation because it would be outdoors. Um, a drive-through service, um, that's, that would be another um, option to curbside pickup structures and, um, and top shop, top notch, ventilation. Now ventilation has even be have, having more of a starring role um, in the needs. So basically we feel like this project 
is a chance for a model future ready building for Deerfield that we could be if we're if this building is something that not only serves the community in all the ways that I outlined, but serves them better and more safely and, and is more healthy um, and, and provides more access to, to really essential services during a public health crisis. Um, this would be a model for not only our town, but our state and our country. So um, here's a, a list of the things that we know and what's not known. So what's known right now is the, like I said, the building footprint. So it's like what you see in those plans, you know, the, the space that it takes up on our property. Um, the estimated costs, about $8 million. Like I said before, the MBLC grant amount, about $4 million. So if our costs go up to nine or 10 million, we'll still just get 4 million. We won't, the 50% from the MBLC won't go up. That, that's fixed. Um, the MBLC only pays for library projects, not things like senior centers or other types of um, civic buildings uh, because it's a library organization. Though, like I said, libraries committed to raising $2 million on our own and maybe more, uh, we hope. Um, if we're not able to fully fund this project, if we get the grant and we have to say no because we're not able to fully fund the project, we would have to start from scratch all over again. And that would be a real shame because there has been a lot of many years and time um, spent by many people dedicated um, to this project and this project is ready to go when when as soon as we get the grant and we take the next step you know we're ready and it's a thought it's a thoughtful project it's an organized project um, it will be like I said lead certified it would be um, a real um, shame to pass this by and the other point on, on a smaller scale is uh, the program room would be a fully staffed and ready to use room that would not um, be <clears throat> other potential community centers in town um, that they would need to hire staff. So we would have staff ready to go doing what we always do, just doing it in a, in a proper space. Uh, what we don't know. So the, like I said, the building design and materials outside of the, the basic footprint of the building um, we just have an initial design. There's a lot to go on that with community feedback and how our needs have changed over the years and with COVID. Um, the actual cost, um, some of you may know that building materials have risen in price in not only recent years, but in the past year, especially. Um, we don't know when we'll get the grant. Um, I, a, I did the length and did a um, bar graph. We don't know when we'll get the grant. It um, could be this year or it could be next year don't know the energy cost of the new building at this point, and we don't know if we'll need additional staff, but we don't think it's likely we'll need additional staff in the, at least in the beginning years as we develop. And that's it. Um, I did tell Carolyn and Casey that I wanted to keep this as, a, as an update, as a refresher for the committees that are meeting, to, the board's committees that are meeting tonight, and for the general public who are who attended tonight, um, just in the interest of time, not to get too long of a discussion. Um, but to, if there are some really um, important answers from the committees, then, you know, we're obviously I'll answer those questions, but um, that is the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, thank thank you. you so much, uh, Candace. I, I just, I don't, I know you well, do. I, I, I was going to compare your data. It took me a Casey, do you think you could mute Julie Cavaco? Julie, if you can hear us, could you please mute? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Candace, I know this is really not a question for you. It's probably Brenda. Um, we have to borrow so much for our sewer plant plants and the piping. Um, I'm just wondering what this is gonna do to our debt ceiling. I don't know if it was Brenda on, Casey? I, I am on. Okay. Um, our debt ceiling is at about 38 million right oh. now. Mm -hmm. um, you know what we have for wastewater treatment projects. If we were to take on all of those, there would be nothing left. But um, how soon will we be taking on the rest of those projects? My question. Right. Yeah, Thank and I, I mean, our hope is to have some infrastructure grants. So, but I mean, that is just an outlying concern uh, I had. And, we, sure. and obviously, 
the costs are going to be higher because of material costs higher. But and I understand you don't have that information either. Right. Mm -hmm. I guess the only other question I had was um, in the in the and I don't remember because it's been so long. What were some of the green? Because um, you know we're trying to support green infrastructure um, as a town. Were there any green options that were provided? Do you know, Candace? Um, I don't have that in front of me, but I know that the initial design, I mean, we are going for LEED certified. So whatever the architect, um, you know, when the time comes, whatever the architect would be telling us we would need to do for green certified, what the options are for materials, for energy source. I know there's been talk in town about different alternative energy sources. And I don't know when the time comes for us to do construction on the building, if we would be ready to, to, to take that on, because it could be a year or two or three um, before we're at that, at that stage. Um, so I think energy source and materials, um, the type of um, like HVAC system we have. <coughs> yeah, that, that's probably, probably in, the, in the glass that we use for the windows, any, any glass that we use in the building, I think would also be, um, you know, we have a more modern material that would, um, you know, prevent, you know, heat, heat loss and, and cooling loss. And this, uh, this is Trevor, a uh, great job on the presentation. It, it's oh, wonderful to see how, you know, for everybody to see how, how you serve our, our community. And it's obvious in many ways. Um, so thank you for all your work you guys do. Um, I was wondering when we would you know, get back in touch with the designer architect to, you know, to really look at a probable probability of cost because I, and, and kind of hammer down those, those costs, because I do think it's quite, a, it's probably going to be more than the eight that they were looking at, you know, several years back. I know they probably factored in, you know, um, yeah. as they're bidding it, they kind of say, well, it's going to increase every year, but as you know, even with just the sewer work alone has gone up a lot in the last couple of years. So just curious when we would sit with them again and really kind of hash out the design and the materials and, you know, try, try and get a, a more solid cost before we commit. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not, I was thinking that I would probably be reaching out to them soon because yeah. they're, they're waiting for us to reach out to them when we have, you know, as we get closer. And as yeah. soon as we know we get that grant, that would probably be one of the first steps is to get back mm -hmm. in touch with, with the architects. I mean, the thing is they would still have, they would have to have a design. Um, right now we just have a schematic yeah. design. So they'd have to right. have, a, you know, an official design. So I don't think, I think it would take a little while, but I also think it would be best yeah. to ask, ask them, you know, right. when right. they think they could, they could give a better idea of cost. Yep. Um, so if we get the grant this year, then, you know, we'd probably find out, or we'd probably start having conversations about yeah. that in August, September. Um, if we don't get it this year, we get it next year, um, then it would be a year right. know, after that. Do we, do we know how long the library um, allows us to, you know, when they award the grant, how long we have before we have to kind of sign papers and commit? Like, well, we have six months. Um, initially, we have six months to, to raise the, the rest of the money, to, mm -hmm. um, you know, to commit to the rest of the money. And sign everything, but you can get extensions, as I'm sure you yep. may have noticed. Um, Greenfield had to, to do that a couple of times. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. I was just thinking, trying to get you know, figure out well, how much is this really going to cost, and then right. you know, figure out you know what, what our borrowing capabilities are and all. So sure, sure. Okay. Thank um, you. I don't have a full screen, but I see both uh, Julie and Jeff. So Julie, go ahead, yes. and then Jeff is in line. I have a couple questions. Um, sure. First question, Taylor's Trevor asked exactly what I was thinking. So there's the six months to commit the additional funding. How long do you have to do the whole project, like to actually build the thing? I think it, I think it's. Um, I'm going to have Nancy um, fill in some of the gaps that I might have. I think the whole pro all told about two years. Is that right, Nancy? Well, my understanding is that. Um, it's actually a little bit longer than that because it's about a, almost a year's process from when we get the grant to when we're ready to, you know, start uh, shoveling in the foundation. And then the actual payments by MBLC will go on for a period of up to five years, but the actual building project is probably three years, but there's, you know, the way that they build it into their budget, um, mm -hmm. the money's happened over a five year course. 
And I also just wanted to also mention that um, the um, when they gave the original cost of the project, there was escalation costs in there for up to three to five years. Um, mm -hmm. So we're just on the brink of that, but certainly this past year has been unprecedented. Um, and we have no way to know what may happen in a year. Things may come down, um, but yeah. considerate of that. So when you say escalation cost, does that mean that the four million is the four million dollars set in stone, or is that um, yes, yes, the four million set in stone? Okay. Um, the other, actually, my other other comment is just a comment, not a question. So you said in your presentation, like you're pointing out that this is a library grant and it covers libraries, not senior centers, right? Yeah. But. Um, the rest of your presentation is the obvious point that libraries are pretty versatile and serve kind of everybody. So yeah. the comments in the town that we would like to have a community center that serves like little kids, teenagers, blah, 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 a library can fill that role. And senior center does nursing and meals, which isn't gonna fall under the library, but there's other types of programs that would serve seniors as well. So right. it's really pretty versatile. And I think also your downstairs room um, has, I remember hearing like it has an outside access possibly and can be locked off in the left of the library. So it'll yeah. be open, available when the library is not open. So it could be usable by any committee in town or any group in town if they sure. want to reserve the space and whatever. So yeah. um, it, that that comment that it's just a library is not as restrictive as maybe sitting in the corner and reading your book, right? It's, um, exactly. it's a lot more of <laughs> yeah. That's all I have to say. Thanks very much. Sure. It's been an interesting Thanks. presentation. Thanks. Jeff. Yes, uh, just, just to clarify, uh, the $4 million uh, or the four million is the grant. That's the fixed dollar amount. Uh, but I believe I picked up that if construction costs are more, you know, we're looking at eight million. But construction costs could be ten million or twelve million, you know, whatever the case may be. In the town, would have to make up that difference. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Or, okay. or not, not just the town. Also, you know, whatever donations. We're going to be working really, really hard right. to offset the town. Right, yes, minus whatever the donations are. And sure. as you were saying, you're looking to uh, raise about $2 million, which would be great. That would be a huge help. Yeah. And uh, I am concerned the finance point as far as the ceiling and what we can borrow. And it's not just the uh, wastewater treatment projects that we have that would really push the envelope, but there's other projects to that are being discussed that may also have an impact on this and one being a senior center. Mm -hmm. But uh, with that being said, I would like to ask whether it be the select board or the town administrator, uh, what the process would be for the residents of Deerfield to accept if we were to receive this grant to accept and approve it and would it be just simply a, uh, whether it be a special town meeting, town meeting, go through an approval process to, uh, to vote this? And if it was voted in positive light, does it still at that point have to go uh, to uh, a ballot uh, as far as a town, town wide ballot for people to approve or not approve? as far as the financial component of it. If from you could my, explain that just to yeah, me. From my understanding, it would uh, kind of be all of that. We, we would, um, if we were awarded and, and it passed, you know, committees and all, and, uh, we would have to have, um, so I'm not quite sure if it would need to be a special town meeting or annual town meeting, depending on the timing that was allowed under the grant. You know, like the school roof wound up being a, a special town meeting we, we would rather it be a annual town meeting where you get the most of the people out there but even still i think once it passes there it would have to be debt excluded so it would definitely have to go to a ballot vote as well um if I, I guess my, wrong prefer about my preference would be you have six months mm -hmm. and if if you find out about it in in may ish or june or july you, you're going to be short for um 
you know, you'd have to have a special town meeting. But my my preference would be just have it, you know, right up front. We're going to get an extension to annual town meeting. Um, but I'm not really sure how the extensions work um, and how many we could get if there was um, any issues with that timeline. Do you do you know anything about, can you just go over what Greenfield did? Because they, 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 had I think at least two extensions, right? I think they had two, yeah. Do you know how long they were for and what they were granted for, Candace? I'm pretty sure they're they're an extension means an, an additional six months. Is that true, Nancy? I didn't think it was as long as six months. I thought it was like 60 to 90 days, something like that, because they did theirs and that was around when they did a community-wide meeting and they you know, we're very clear with MBLC what their timeline was of what they were doing and then how they got to their voting process. Mm -hmm. um, Did they do an annual town meeting or was that um, an annual meeting or was that actually? Um, I recall that it was a special meeting. I don't know that it was an annual meeting, but then it did go to a community wide vote. Right. Oh, oh yeah, you have to have a ballot right. vote to take on debt. But um, okay, I'm I'm just saying up front that I I feel like it would be I would prefer an extension to annual town meeting versus a special town meeting. I yeah, think I, that um, you know there seems like um, the MBLC is very willing to work with communities when you present the logistics that you're working with, and so you know they will do their best to work with us, and we, you know we may make those proposals. Um, to them of this is what we would like to do. And then they can, you know, we, they can guide us as well. Um, yeah. But they've been doing this for a long time. Um, sure. There were 28 libraries in this round, um, you know, so, um, and the staff that are involved with us have been, you know, involved with this entire group of libraries. So, you know, they're very much aware of the process and Good. what um, freedom we have with, you know, requesting those kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. Um, did anybody else have any questions? Casey, can you see if anybody has any questions? I, I can't, can't see more than four people. Yes, I am scrolling. If anybody has questions and they're calling in, they can hit star six and that will open up their mic so that they can ask those questions. In some cases, unfortunately, I've had to uh, mute people because we couldn't hear the presentation. So we also wanted to just say that this presentation will be put up on the Tilton website as well. And I believe it um, can be made into a YouTube so that people can oh, look at it again because there's a lot of um, good information in there that people may want to refer to. Yeah, it was very well done. Joyously, Candace, you get to be on YouTube because you presented during the selectmen's meeting. So you get to be the superstar. <laughs> um, Jeff has a question. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, just just one last question. Uh, with dollar amounts, has there been any projected uh, impact on the tax rates of the residents of Deerfield with this addition? whether it be 4 million or 6 million or whatever, has anybody yet, looked Jeff. at high property taxes? No, but I can definitely ask Brenda tomorrow. She hopped off the meeting, but I can ask her that tomorrow. Okay, just wondering, thank you. We can get a per million um, impact, Casey. Why don't you find that out? Um, in the meantime, I hope everybody participates in the Tilton Library fundraisers. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, Jack, Jack, did I can't see you, but does Jack, do you have any questions? He's muted. You're muted. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've, uh, I've been on this committee long enough that I've, I've been in. Uh, in many meetings um, about the library. And um, so I don't really have any questions. I, I think uh, 
at this point, you know, the, the, the elephant in the room is how much the construction costs um, are actually going to go up. And my memory is that we were warned back when that the constru construction costs generally go up about 15% a year. And this year, of course, it's way more than that. So I think I think Jeff's comment that the the ultimate cost could be more like eleven or twelve million dollars is is probably dead on. And uh, I I don't recall that the the four million dollars in grant money was written in stone, regardless of how how much construction costs um, go up. So. True. Usually, like the school roof program, it it was a um, it was forty eight percent or forty eight point two percent or whatever of the thing, and it it fluctuated depending right. on the cost. And it, when it and usually you get your grant money at the end, so they see whatever it is, you spend all your money, and then they give you a so, portion. So, I, so are, I so are we sure different. that we're locked in at four million, and we're absolutely sure? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, so first time we heard that it was not uh, yeah it was a it's a little disheartening the first time you hear yes it. <laughs> how did they come up with that uh, do we know how they came at that number or is it just based on well they do fifty percent of the estimated cost so whatever cost we gave them at, on our ap application which is estimated then they they will commit to fifty percent of that um, so we should have inflated that early then is that what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm not sure that we could. That was the number no, that we were true. given based on the based right. on the the original design. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is there is that built-in escalator, um, as Candace referenced, but you know, 15% is not. Yeah, no, it not gets eaten up quick. Here. I mean, yep. we're like, I think it's at least a third to maybe even a half again. Yeah. You know, cost right, right now. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the quotes that we got. Well, if, if it's of any comfort, um, do you know of a small town in, in the Berkshires called Monterey? A oh, yeah. Small town? Yep. Well, they yep. got their library. They were on the waiting list and they moved up and they got their, their, their town said yes and they built it and they came in under budget. Oh, very so nice. It can be done. It can be done. And I, you know, I'll have some conversations with that director and say, how did you do it? <laughs> it is pretty small. I'll tell you yeah. that. But it was, <laughs> but it was still mind. under budget. Yeah. And it's, no, and it's true. It's yep. small, but small, but beautiful. They did a nice job with it. It looks nice. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming, Candace. Yes, thank you, thank you for all your work. Thank, thank, you, you, thank everyone who's here and, and ask questions and just, um, you know, let us yep. present. We'll keep um, I think it would be a good idea to come um, it, as soon as you find out any information, get on our agenda so we can discuss um, some strategies and try to figure absolutely. out absolutely how we're going to work. Okay. We'll be there. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is um, Casey's uh, um, purchasing designation. Casey, uh, you updated this and we just need I to did. Yep. You just need to vote to sign it, right? Yes. yes, so I need, in order for an RFP to go out and we hadn't done it because we didn't have an RFP. In order for an RFP to go out, you have to notify the inspector general's office that a chief procurement officer has been designated. This form is that designation. So what the board needs to do is approve it and authorize the chair to sign it, please. So make a motion to approve um, Casey Warner, town administrator, to be the Deerfield uh, CPO designation for MCPPO. And approve the, and in that motion, I approve the chair to sign. Dave Wolfram, second it. Okay, is there any further discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor? Dave Wolfram, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn S, aye. Um, so Casey, uh, you're good now on this for another year or do we have to do this every year? The three year. Um, is it three year? Well, my designation is a three year. What generally what you do is you notify the IG's office for instance, if there was a changeover in personnel, you so would need to. So once we've done this, once we've done this, we don't have to. It should be, them. yeah, unless they inform me mm -hmm. differently, yes. So when you go to, when you do finish your updates on your class and renew for the next three years, if there, if this has not changed, we do not have to submit anything else, right? I don't believe so. And okay. I just finished my updates. I just got my recertification in January. 
Good okay, job. so you're good. You. Good job is right. Yep. I can't believe it. Middle of COVID. That is a lot of work. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's oh, no. it's akin to the treasurer and accountant. <laughs> uh, COVID, COVID didn't actually start yet. So yeah. It, uh, well, I finished okay. it. The last class I took was last fall, and yep. we all had to transition to you know remote yep. classes. It was different. Sure. Oh God, gross. Okay, so feel um, good that you're certifiable now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So you're all done. You're all set. Thank you for doing. Thank you. This. All right. Um, next item on the agenda is land deposition um, RFP. Yes. Um, so that's now, the reason you saw the CPO designation first. Yes. Okay. Um, we have the appraisal choices, and yeah. I, I don't want to wait. I'm five good or with, weeks. No, I'm good with the and the other ones less money. Yeah, I know, but I. Even that one, I'd like to see if we could scoot along a little bit more. Yeah. Well, one was for like 1100 or something like that, right? So they're for each, parcel. it's 1100 a parcel. That was the price from, we only got two responses. We sent out eight requests. Yeah. yeah. Um, the cost is the same. It's the time frame. So Bennett at Bennett Franklin, he can turn that around in about three weeks as opposed oh. to the other I person you're saying i see what so you're saying. that's yeah so my suggestion to the and and what i can do is it's twenty two hundred dollars i can yep. get that contract signed and get it okay. uh turned around i've actually talked Let's to jennifer it. we're gonna we're gonna facilitate that on friday because he's okay. gonna need information from us so okay. un, unless the board has a problem with it i think that's the fastest turnaround we can get yep. right i'm good with that dave are you all right with that yep yep definitely um, me too. I we need to get okay. moving on this as fast as we can. So and so you. what I've been doing is working on the, the RFP, and we're going to need one for each property. Uh, but we do need the appraised value because it has to be published in that RFP. Right. Um, what I do need the board to do is vote to dispose of both parcels. It's map one sixty eight, lot twenty one, parcels two one and two two. To make a motion to um, dispose of both parcels. I'll second that. Okay, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Dave Wolfram, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay, thank you. Casey, do you wanna add anything more into that? Um, basically, what we, there's a series of things that have to happen, but the first thing that really needs to be done is to create both RFPs and set up the timeline. And so okay. there's requirements in the state law that say certain things have to be published for a period of a month. Um, they have to be published in certain ways in certain newspapers and certain other periodicals. So what I'm doing is putting that timeline together backwards like we do with zoning articles so that we can hit these, these dates effectively. But now that I know that we have a turnaround of about three weeks on the appraisal that'll help me plan better okay thank you next item on the agenda is the community services coordinator and social um, worker job descriptions um casey uh did not um put that in our uh, packet yeah i forgot but it's not a not a huge deal but i did want you to make sure that you were reading the town of Acton's community services coordinator because I think that is the closest one that we were interested in. Yes. And then we have to combine it with the community health center's um, job description. Um, and so I wanted to make sure if you looked at it, if there was anything in particular that you felt very strongly for or against um, that so when we have further discussions with the community health center that um, that's included. And then the other um, situation was with the social worker that is going through CSO. And I just wanted to make sure that we compared the CSO job description with our job description that we had generated by um, you know, our volunteers and make sure that we're not missing anything in the job descriptions. Um, you know, I'm sure we can have discussions with the CSO to make sure if there's anything missing. Um, but I so I, wanna... I have a question. Right. If we're contracting with two with two other groups, 
then we shouldn't need a job description because you're contracting that well, service and we're not taking on the employment. But we're not, but we're not experts. And so the idea was to take from the job descriptions what things that we were looking for and the, and the job descriptions were providing us with some input to what the contracted services would be providing. Um, the CSO situation is there's no liability uh, and there's no financial commitment at all because it's grant funded and, and funded upfront by the CSO group. The CSO group, it, it, I guess I would look at this, that social worker position as like emergency room medicine in a hospital. You know, it's a crisis situation. You go and they're with the police officers and their intervention, or if you call from the schools or something like that, the, you know, they re would respond on a crisis level. The community services coordinator in, in the scope of discussions that I've had back and forth in the last month, I mean, this is really, the reason why I keep bringing it up is because there ha this is really a brand new discussion, fairly brand new. Um, the police and everybody's been working on this for, I mean, John Bachorek and Jen Bartik have put tons and tons of effort into this over the last few months and um, have really taken the suggestion of, um, um, the Deerfield Inclusion Group and different comments and the police reform bill in mind to make sure and and but I I have been relatively late to the table on this and and so I've been working very hard to become educated and what I see is the gap for us is um, your preventative and primary care like in a hospital kind of person. So the way I'm thinking of patching this together is, is contracting with the community health center in Greenfield on a similar basis that they already have a, a couple positions and they would be willing to expand another full-time person and half of that would be our time. 12 hours a week are, don are part of the, would be paid for by the SIG grant that we have this year. And we hopefully by this partnership, we would be, this is the last of a three-year grant, of, of the three-year grant. And then we would be at the bottom of the pile and highly unlikely to get funded for next year. So the idea is to come up with this pilot program with partner with community health and, at, and offer a more robust position and outreach so that we could attract the money for a SIG type grant. I'm not sure how the grant system's working, but it's much more competitive um, next year. And we have to do something different than just fill in the paperwork when Emmett was there, because Emmett really championed us um, at the Council of Aging group um, because we were three towns. So we have the fact that we have three towns working together, but that's about it. So this, in the course of a year, we're gonna look at what the grant requirements are and try to make build our story. So we're in a good position to get funding for next year or, or and I'm not sure if that's another three year round or if it's just a one year every year renewable. But the idea is to build our story and provide better services so that we would be competitive for next year's grant. But that's only 12 hours. So we'd have to, we'd like to add at least three to four hours and I'm starting smaller rather than bigger to go to the 19 hours because I'm not really sure what the need is, although I know it's really a need. And the, and the idea is that this is for people that have no, I, you know, it's a resource for people that don't know how to connect, if they have start or they're aware of a problem or a start of a problem. And it's also the follow-up to people that are already in crisis because you, you've been addressed as a crisis, but then there's no follow-up. So, so what's preventing you from going into crisis again? It's so the idea is to provide some mental health um, you know, services in town and connect people with services. And, you know, a lot of times there is like veterans outreach programs, but people aren't even aware of them. This is to connect all the services for 
you know, our whole community and, and really enhance what is being delivered to the seniors. And um, I, I feel really strongly about this. I, I think we can pull this off with no financial impact to the town once we get started in the first year. I'm looking at about $7,300, give or take, because we don't really know, uh, you know what the cost of the person is gonna be, but the price range when I was talking to um, the community health center is in that range. And we could fund that, I think, through the ARPA funds because mental health issues are certainly documented through the you know, COVID um, times. And then one, we could work, or I'm gonna work with the community health services to find out what the medical coding is so that they can do the billing and that it would be sustainable. The whole idea is that this is be sustainable and continue to attract grants and it would enhance services to us. Um, I, I really feel there is very, very limited financial exposure on this. Looked into the liability. The liability is being handled 100% by CSO and the community health center. Um, they would report on site or through Casey Casey would be in the loop. It's all confidential, of course. So, um, you know, we would have limited oversight, but it's the way it's supposed to be. But there would be real communication between the CSO person, the community health per person, and all, you know, and, and the schools, and, um, you know, any of the school personnel. And, and I have to say, uh, all the years that we've been to housing court, I think you can justify it because I would say every single case that we've taken to housing court has had an underlying mental health issue that we have not addressed. Um, if we don't address some of these concerns, they're gonna end up in the schools and they're gonna cost us more money anyway. So the idea is to, I mean, I feel like this is a win-win. So um, I, I want us to keep working on this. I just wanted you to look at the community health center can't agree on that. I mean, we can't sign it and we can't even commit to it until um, we go to the BOO to make sure that they approve the use of the SIG money um, towards this person. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, not a, right now it's empty. So the, uh, to me, this is perfect timing to try to get a better, more robust job description for that person. Um, but we also have to have, you know, nail down the guidelines for the for the ARPA money. Um, it's certainly from the meetings I've been to, it's going to qualify. But as Casey says, it's not 100% written. Nope. So Carolyn, I'm confused. Are we contracting with another group or are we hiring somebody? Because they're two very different things. We are, we are contracting with the community health center and we are contracting with CSO to be or CSO has been contracted to provide the services. We are okay, so the only contract that we have um, input on is the community health center one. The CSO one was already is already agreed to. So uh, I, there's a lot more work that needs to be done on this before I can jump on board. Um, I would uh, I, I need to see the needs more, um, the funding. And um, I, I'm thrilled that, that the three police communities have gotten together with, um, with CSO. I think that's a great first step at looking at how um, social work can address, you know, the needs um, as, it, as it relates to emergencies um, for de-escalation and, and getting, getting mental health to, to people who need it in those crisis situations. So I think what's been a little confusing is these are two completely different positions. Um, one that we're talking about already that's implemented that we really don't have much involvement in. Uh, John Paterk is already working on that with, with the other communities. And that is, um, that is that emergency need. If there is some you know, traumatic situation that's going on, better handled you know, with help from a social worker than the police department. That I think that's a great pilot program to see um, that happen and bring that help to our community. This other 
completely other position um, it may have merit, but I still and, and I, I get it. I, I get I understand the needs and why Carolyn is advocating for this. I still need to understand those needs and the cost to us and and juxtapose those to the other needs of the town. Um, so if, if it can be pulled off where it doesn't cost us uh, money and we can provide a service um, that that's a home run or little amount. But I just think there is still there is still liability with this person because it would be a, a, a Deerfield employee or it's a contract through. No, it would be contracted. And, right, uh, but they're still working through us. And there are a lot of other agencies that actually get funding in our community, in our county that do this type of work. Um, so we're talking about pulling on somebody to do it for specifically Deerfield. Um, and then I guess Sundorn and Waitley too, because they would be, if we're doing the SIG grant, it will be coming through them as well. I just, there's still, as you said, there's still work to kind of nail out, nail this down. Um, and I, I just have to get behind that a little bit more and understand a little bit better. I think Not sold yet. Trevor, the easiest, or the, the reason why I'm so committed to it is because you try, what you're trying to do is help people come up with real, have, have a feeling that there are solutions and that they are not hopeless. And one of the biggest things, you know, you, you, certainly if someone is, say someone is suicidal or, you know, something like that, you know, you have the crisis person responding and, but then, you know, so it gets temporarily resolved, but that doesn't mean that it's fixed. And it, and so the idea of a preventative or follow-up person is that there is some kind of help outside the crisis level. I mean, I'm thrilled to death that we are dealing with the crisis level and, but to be effective, you have to have that preventative or primary kind of care too. And I think this is like makes a full package. And one of the things that I think is, I mean, signing up for Medicare is a huge, I mean, it was a hassle, I have to tell you. So, I mean, all the seniors have so much stuff they have to pay attention to and they try to get sorted out and and, and so to have a outreach person that is, is, has really a lot of strengths and, and outreach and is educated really well. I mean, I, I just feel like this is so to the advantage of our seniors. So the SIG grant will be paying for a person that is, is you know, just a better, a, a better resource. And then we also have these few hours for Deerfield and, 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 and the reason I'm starting small is because I don't, you know, this is brand new. So it's, it's going to be hard to get, you know, I know it's there. I know the need is there, but I'm just not sure how many hours of, you know, a week, but if we can start out small, then um, I feel like there's a lot of, there's a place for communication and a resource and we'll get a grasp on how, how, what the real job is on this. But the community health center is willing to hire a full-time person and then allocate, you know, up to half. I mean, I'm not committing more than a half at this point, but a half-time person. So I, I, I think it's, I mean, I, I know there's a lot more work, but that's why I wanted you to look at the material and try to figure out what we want to see. Casey. So to Trevor's point, there's some more background that's going to have to happen. We're going to have to run this past um, the state related to the SIG grant and yes, the loop in needs to happen, not only with the boo, but with the director. And honestly, we can't, and I, I literally went to two ARPA meetings today. First of all, and I was gonna tell you this later, but first of all, the ARPA guidance from the treasury is not out and we don't expect it for at least three weeks. And second, the biggest caution from Sean Cronin, who's the deputy, senior deputy uh, head of uh, and uh, is not to commit to using these funds to support FY22 budget items without clearance from the interpretation through treasury. 
And I know that's not what anybody wants to hear, least of all me, but that was the caution. And I would caution us to be very careful about that. Casey, I don't have any issues with that, but my meeting with Sean Cronin was very clear that this was some of the money it is definitely eligible for economic incentives like behavioral health is also there but he said if you're health if you're supporting fy22 budget items you have to be very careful right now well yes but this is this contract is going to be it's not a budget item per se because it's we're going to use arpa money if if to to fill any gap between what the hours are for sig the sig grant and the we have the SIG grant already for one more year, okay? So that's not an issue. And, and whatever monies that we use to fill the gap are ARPA money. And that ARPA money is coming next month and it's under the discretion of the select board, your, your um, chief financial officers. So we can decide to spend that money on this if, if it fits the guidelines. So it has no financial impact, it has no impact Yes, I'm going to list this in the Board of Health budget, but the Board of Health budget is going to say zero. So whenever, if it starts, if we don't get the guidance until July. We can't, we can't sign the contract until after we get the guidance anyway. So it doesn't matter if the guidance doesn't come out until July or August. Um, you know, From a sustainability perspective, though, I think one thing that it's something that I was thinking about over the weekend. From a sustainability perspective it could be difficult to sustain that that contract, for instance, without the economic backbone to support it. And ARPA funds are not gonna be there forever. They will be for about, I think the end on the ARPA from what I heard today is 2024, but we don't necessarily have the interpretation. And so behavioral health is a portion of that. We we will not It's a question of how long do you think we'll need to sustain this through ARPA? There may well, be other projects that we need to use ARPA for. I'm, I'm not worried about that because we will fill it, figure out the billing. Um, it's just that this is unusual. You have to have the partnership. And then once you fig- figure out the billing to the health insurance, it's no different than the CSO is figured out how to bill on based on the Pittsfield model on how to bill for health insurance for their intervention and how you s- sustain it. So we just need a few months to figure out the billing code to um, sustain the, our gap coverage. And, and certainly we can afford, and because it, it will cover, it will, the ARPA money is coming in the next month, the half of it, and then the other half will be later on. And you, you will have through fiscal year 2024, we got plenty of time and we're talking very little money. I mean, we're talking a couple thousand bucks, seriously. So it's not very much. So I, I'm just saying, I'm, I know there's more work. I know this has been fast, but we are not hiring the people directly. This is not additional staff. This is contracted services, but I want as much input as possible to the, how the contract services are set up. And so far we've had great participation from Chief Bachorek and Jen Bartek on this on the CSO position. And then in the process, I've felt that there's this another huge gap and the Acton's solution, town solution, you know, the job description for their um, community services coordinator fits what I'm I'm seeing as this gap. And so working with the community health center, I think we can, we can come up with um, a job description that fits their, what they're doing in their programs as well. So um, that's why I, we don't have the opportunity, we can't do anything unless we have a public meeting. So all I'm asking is that if Dave and Trevor keep looking at the material and keep connecting with Casey so you can let me know what's happening so I can keep working on this. I wicked appreciate it, that's all. Because I think this is is a win-win for Deerfield, for our seniors, for everybody. And um, I I just, if we can help even one or two people feel like there's real solutions to their problems, I, I think it's well worth the money.
So anyway, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, um, but just keep looking at it. I'm working with the community health center. They've been wonderful. They're really, really engaged in this. They're excited. I see this as a way to continue the money with the uh, SIG grant money, you know, for the seniors so we can keep that position open because otherwise it's going away. And that, I mean, and we've really gotten used to having it. So for no other reason, we've got to figure out how to cover this person and keep it going. So, um, um, well, but I gonna, think, what? What we got to do is, you know, obviously this is something we want, uh, but we've got to determine what our actual needs are so we can defend it to the town when it comes to that point. Without that data, it's, it's, that's why I felt like if we could risk a few thousand dollars of our upper money, I mean, I, I think we're getting 1.2, 1.4. We don't even have a final dollar amount. So if if it looks like it's like 7,500 bucks, I think it's going to be, look, my early estimates are like $7,300. But if we could use $7,300 to get this started so we can actually decide what the needs are in town and have a better grasp. And I am starting in smaller hours, you know, three or four hours a week. Um, you know, we could go up to the seven hours a week um, under the contract, but um, if we start small, we can get a gauge on it. And, and I think that's really important. But the most important thing is to be able to, you know, figure out the communication so that all these people are talking together. So all the services are, in Deerfield and talking to each other. And that's, mm -hmm. I, I guess, so the people don't keep falling through the cracks and f or feel like there's no help. And somehow we've got to coordinate that. And so we're, we're, uh, we're definitely open to ideas. We're definitely trying to figure it out. Um, so I think, and we have the opportunity to set it up the way we want. Uh, so I'm kind of excited about that. It's It's been, it's been pretty exciting what I've seen on the police department end. And I, I have to, again, praise John Pachorek and Jen Bartek because, you know, it got done because of them. They were wonderful. And they've been major motivators for that happening. And um, so this is part of that project, the, the outfall of that project. Okay, thank you. So um, Casey, how about your report? So you kind of touched on a couple of the things that I was going to talk about opening town hall. Um, basically, the main concerns are preventing any kind of spread through the town hall for residents visiting us, um, safety and making sure that we're cleaning. Those are some of the biggest things we have to deal with. But one of the biggest issues, and I think Carol, Carolyn touched on it earlier, is limiting access and time frames so that people come in, do their business, or meet with the official that they need to meet with in a short period of time um, so that that business gets conducted safely since there's still the, the issues of time frames when you're meeting someone face-to-face. -face. And I had talked to Barb as well about where, and if you look in the reopening plan that we put together last year, you'll see that most of the interactions that would be between one-on-one -on -one official meetings would be in the main meeting room so that we can prevent close interactions and, and have enough space for circulation of air, et cetera. So I've asked Dick, to work with me on making some revisions to the reopening plan in preparation for the board to review it at an upcoming meeting. Um, as I mentioned during the discussion with Dan, we may have some general bylaw changes. I'm still working on language, but general bylaw changes will require a hearing. So those things need to be, and I'm doing that right now, put into a schedule so that the hearings can be conducted in the manner required statutorily for notification, but also um, so that there's lead time for people to read the changes. Um, with any personnel bylaw change, which uh, if you recall, the personnel board has, rec has two recommendations for changes to the holidays, um, that also requires notification to employees. 
I've reached out, I had some questions from the personnel board a couple meetings ago about getting some training and assistance for them. So I reached out to a retired HR professional that I know, and I'm going to see if she can give me some other information so that perhaps we can work up some sort of a session with her and them utilizing the funds in their account because they really could use some of that familiarity. So I can tell them something, but sometimes if there's a more structured presentation, I think it, it could be more useful. So I'm working on that. As I mentioned before, ARPA, there were several ARPA meetings today. The main takeaways are Treasury has not provided in-depth interpretation of the law and DLS is loath to give us any guidance until we see that interpretation. It could be broad or it could be very narrow. Nobody's really sure. Um, the second main takeaway is compliance is going to be key and we may have to, our record keeping and audits are probably going to be required based on the estimated amount of money we'll be getting. As Carolyn mentioned, it's going to come in two tranches. You'll get 50% now and 50% at a later date. Um, there may also, and that's the local aid coming to the town. There's, other, there's also going to be other aid packages that will run through the state. The state will be the fiduciary passing this out from the federal government, which is why it's 50, key. We're under 50,000. 50, yeah. Yes, for the About direct payments involved. to the town. That 50% yeah. will come from the state based on a payment from the feds. Um, but one of the reasons DLS, and I say DLS, I mean Division of Local Services, which is a sub of DOR. Um, one of the reasons they're loath to say you can and can't do things definitively right now is because they're waiting to see what Treasury will allow based on the interpretation of the law. There are a couple things that we can expect will be approved. For instance, as you saw earlier with CARES Act funding and ESSER funding for the schools, there was some allowance for small building in the case of the ESSER, the projects that related around that were related to ventilation. So we may see that same allowance in ARPA. They're telling us that we should be cautiously optimistic about that. So I've started work on trying to get some information for the town hall because we could use that assistance as well. It really uh, we wasn't on my radar screen before. Um, so we, we would use the it. funding. We would use the funding for the police, um, the for the police department uh, HVAC system. Right, and we had talked about that. We may be able to do it for our own HVAC system as well. Yeah, but we don't know what that would look like. So, okay, and then the other thing, there may be other grant opportunities through ARPA. We're not sure yet because, again, they have to interpret what they would be looking at. So, and that if there are grant opportunities, again, those would be administered through the state. And that's really, oh, the item unanticipated, I just wanted to give a brief overview of that. It's really the vote of the order by the Department of, the vote and the order by the Department of Public Utilities to explore other avenues of notification to residents in the state of hearings and possible changes to the law that they promulgate. Because I think one of the things that they experienced in COVID like we did is there's different platforms to gain public involvement and it's worthwhile exploring how else you can reach out to the public when it's not just newspaper and you can't walk into a hearing. Um, and I would say that's something that's been a challenge for us as well, especially based on the conversations I've had about notices. So it, it's interesting that this is coming up from DPU because most local, local governments are facing it too. And so are counties, the counties that are actually still working. <laughs> Okay. I think Trevor had to hop. Yeah, Trevor had to, he's not feeling well. I really feel bad. Um, Dave, did you have any questions on, uh, or Jeff, did you have any questions, Casey, on this? Because this is mostly financial stuff. Yeah, not, not on this. You know, I don't know enough about it. I'm listening and learning as we go. I have a general idea, but more information, the better. So um, no comment at the moment. Thank you. 
all the information. Have some more information that I can pass out, but it's very brief. I just didn't get a chance to scan it for you. Um, right, no, no problem. Thank you. It's very, it's, it is very general at this point, but um, I certainly feel 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 that the Leary the Leary lot is going to be um, acceptable economic stimu you know a stimulus. I I feel like also we have to clarify it obviously, but the revenue um, at least a few thousand, a few tens of thousands of dollars can be used for revenue replacement. What we received in 2019 versus what we received, um, uh, you know, in 2021, uh, uh, I mean 20. If you look at um, Brenda's figures, there's a, just a couple line items that are less. Most generally, everything was okay. But there's a couple line items, Jeff, if you remember in the revenue that were less um, had dropped and um, it looks like we could replace it in, in the preliminary guidance that I had gotten through my meetings. Um, you could replace some of those line items with because they were general excise revenue kind of things. So, um, but Casey, we're, I mean, obviously we can't start putting in for it until we get better guidance, but um, any shortfall that we had last year, um, I think, you know, it looks like it's in the 80,000 to hundred thousand dollar range. We, I think can be replaced. So right. if we look at the HVAC system, if we look at, um, revenue replacement, we look at the literary lot, Chris, Chris Curtis would, would put in for the MVP, um, over and above normal paving, you know, to do the, um, pervious surface kind of right. work, but we could do the initial um, paving work would be, you know, um, from the ARPA grant, and that would make huge enhancement to downtown and help, yeah. you know, um, would help Berkshire Brewing. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I feel like, you know, there's quite a few things that would really be good that we would like to spend money on already that we had intentions on spending on money. So um, it's kind of exciting. I, I think that I think there's less strings attached to this money than there was the previous COVID money. So all, all like those things that you mentioned can be a huge help. There's no question about it. And and if that possibility of the HVAC system for the police department, that would be great. That that would be a plus plus, simply a win for everybody there. Absolutely, because we're man, you know, we're our cells are not going to be approved by DPH if we don't replace right. that system. Not to mention the fact that it's not healthy or, or good for our police officers. So if we get that. No, that right. That needs to be done. Yeah, we already determined that. So ho hopefully, we can spend the money on that, and that would be very helpful. Yes, it would. I think some of the school items. Um, you know, related to, um, you know, the HVAC system and stuff like that will be covered and they will be receiving money. And so that schools will, will get their own money. Yeah. And so that will help us quite a bit. It will help yeah. us meet the needs that we have because the schools will get their own tranche of money. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously Casey's following it, but let me tell you, I'm following it too because... <laughs> <laughs> Anything that hey, has money out help. there, I'm after. So I've already been to a couple meetings. Casey's been to a couple meetings, and they have been different meetings. Although yes. I think Sean Cronin's saying the basic, you know, the same basic story. But yes. um, I, you know, I think I think it, I'm very positive. I'm 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 not depressed at all about us not missing out this time. And the infrastructure um, program that they're talking about gives us a lot more leeway too and that's coming and we mm -hmm. and we have actual infrastructure the projects right that we're ready to go and that we have to do so I, i'm like we're in such better shape than we were in 2008 this you know this for us as a town this crisis was much less impactful than the 2008 crisis and um and part of it is you know we had a learning curve what, how do we yeah. get ready and we also had all this stuff that we are already doing anyway, and that we had to do. So I think we're, you know, we're in much I think better. A time we're a little better prepared this time around. Yes, 
Yes. Yeah. Well, it's like every flooding event we get, we're a little bit better prepared for the next one. So mm -hmm. this this financial impact definitely was less financial impact than um, 2008. And, Correct. and we were not able to take advantage of that ARPA money um, at all. And, and that was really disgusting. We just weren't in the position to do it. So um, I have to say, Casey's been on top of this. All of us have been thinking about this through the whole year. So I think we're ready. Okay, is there anything else anybody wants to talk? Oh, um, the D uh, item's not anticipated. So did you want to send comments in about this? It's essentially a request for comments to add. Do you want to add, do you have suggestions for DPU to add notification platforms? For instance, social media. I think they're probably considering it anyway, but maybe if the board had comments, you could send it to me individually I, I, and I can forward I it really to them. Want us, I want us to put in from, require social media um, notification somehow, whether I don't know. You have to. We have to figure out some kind of social media request. But then also, I think it's important that they notify the town clerks. They could send out a notice to the all 351 town clerks with like a push a button, yep. and that is basic. But I DP, based on my experience with the pipeline, um, DPU has does a horrible job of, it, of I mean, you have to hunt stuff down. So I think the town clerk thing, the social media notification to any, um, you know, organized groups that are whatever, wherever the notice, you know, we'll have to come up with something defined, Casey. So I want you to think about it. But, you know, I don't want to just say environmental groups, but it, it has to be, you know, some way to do the land trust audubon you know that whole all those groups because what they do is they don't things go through and you don't know about it until it's too late so how about uh, it maybe it should be established land and conservation groups yeah we got to think about it but um you know uh i'll try to um i'll, I'll call I'll call a couple lawyers or something that were involved in the pipeline fight and see what what they're suggesting. If that's okay with you, Dave, can we send a letter out? Yes, most definitely. Okay. All right. It's just comments. It's not, yeah. but I feel like it shouldn't be without comments because people don't know things are happening. And I that that was very clear. You had to have this whole network watching stuff, and that that was horrible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jeff's got his hand up. Yes, Jeff, yeah. go ahead. Just, just, uh, and I know I, it's public comment. Uh, I, I just would like to say, uh, I really appreciate uh, all the uh, select board's review of the planning board and bylaw language and being a little cautious with that. And I thought David brought up uh, several good points and Trevor also. Uh, with with language, and I think we've all dealt with that. You know, there's nothing wrong with trying to be cautious and be green and so on and so forth. But uh, when you get into some vague language, that can lead to lawsuits. So uh, some of that language that was read tonight had me a little concerned. Uh, one as a resident and one if I were to be a developer coming to town uh, on both instances, there were some issues there that I would really have a hard time with. And one, I would either just say thanks, but no thanks and walk away from Deerfield and not look at establishing business. And, and or the other is I would put in my application and if it got turned down with the vague language, I would turn around to the town. Uh, so just a word of caution and I really appreciate what you're saying. I, I understand we wanna do smart growth and I agree with that 100%, but on a financial component, I would hate us, I would hate for us as a town, the town of Deerfield to put a stranglehold on new growth revenue. And if we don't have that new growth revenue, we know what's gonna to happen to our taxes. 
So, and I know Dave has mentioned this before, as far as, you know, development and keeping an eye on the commercial and industrial and that. And I think he brings up some very valid points. So uh, with the with the playing board bylaws in the language, I just hope we're a little cautious to make sure that whatever language there is, we can enforce. If we leave vague language in there, I think, I think as a town, we leave ourselves open for a lot of issues. That's all. But uh, thank you. Thank you for your efforts. I appreciate that. I think we are looking for balance and um, I mean, I think that's clear, but also I think we're just super aware that if, if it's not clear, mm -hmm. and you can't enforce it. It's awful from a regulatory point of view. And, and that's why I was really relieved to see the, the shadow part removed from the solars. I realize that that's an issue, but there's, there's no way that we can enforce that. I mean, I don't know how you can get us to enforce that kind of um, language. And so I mm -hmm. think that's, I'm, I'm pleased that there seems to be some recognition that you have to have balance. Right. Well, I, I appreciate your review of the language and being aware of that. The whole, the whole committee and Casey also uh, just hopefully going forward, people will be- a You don't want to see what I found. <laughs> I found all the things that sort of escape your eye if you've looked at it 15 times. But uh, I was just going to say, those are very wise comments, Jeff. Maybe you would want to either send that to the planning board or attend the meeting and make that comment because it's- I will, I will probably as try- appropriate to as appropriate as anyone else. To attend the meeting. Uh, and if I, can't, if I can't attend their next meeting, then- uh, you know, the informational night, I would probably at least address it there. If, yeah, but if, then it's uh, too late, Jeff. It's too late. Yeah, that is true. It is too late. The at public that hearing point. is Monday. Yeah, we're trying to we're trying to have impact before before it gets to the prior to. Oh. Well, I'll I'll try to catch uh, the next planning board meeting then. Yeah, I'll send you the notice. Yeah. Okay. Thank. You. All right. Well. I'll take a, a motion to adjourn. Is there any other public comment? I guess I should say, I'm sorry. I didn't see any. Do you see anything, Casey? Okay. Dave, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. You really want to? It's not nine o'clock yet. <laughs> I, think, I think I was trying for two hours and I didn't quite make it. <laughs> I missed the 11, 12 o'clock ones we used to have with Mark. I know. <laughs> Please, I don't want to go back there. <laughs> but that was prior to Zoom meetings. Yes. Oh my God, we were with all the Zoom meetings we have. We I, I couldn't make it till midnight anymore. <laughs> no, her eyes would glaze over just like oh. mine. So I make a motion that we adjourn. <laughs> all right, and I will second that. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Dave Wolfram, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. All right.